let's look at the last machine in this series of impossible machines. It's, I call it the correlation telephone. And uh, so first I describe what it should do. Right? So now what it should do is um, it works by having a source of particles. And the particles actually go in different directions and may be very far separated from each other in the end. Right? So, and traditionally we say that one, of, one side of this experiment is operated by a physicist called Alice and the other side is operated by a physicist called Bob. Now, this is just a correlation. Right? So um, there's no possibility that they can talk to each other. Right? They don't have a phone line on the side. They just have these particles. Right? And the question is now, um, can they use that to communicate? So how, how could they do that? Right? And this, this is a very limit, limited situation. What Alice is able to do is very limited. And, but she could actually um, choose a measurement. And of course, builds it up, right? Uh, yeah. So she builds a measurement device, and it could be like, um, maybe just call them A1 and A2, the possible measurements that you can make. Just two different ones will actually be enough. And Bob, well, he gets, also gets a particle, and he wants to detect something, and Bob tries to detect of which. So, now correlation is a very common thing in also in classical probability, so to, it's a good starter to think about the situation where Alice and Bob have both, the source here is a newspaper publishing house, and Alice buys a copy in Singapore, and Bob buys a copy in New York. And they, so they open the uh, they open the, the first page and they find exactly the same text. Right? So this, there's nothing mysterious about this at all. Right? So correlation, and even perfect correlation, is something that is very commonplace in physics. So now, how can they use that to communicate? Well, they can't. Right? And uh, so this is, this is actually impossible. You might almost expect that I will prove this by reduction to something else, but I think this is impossible enough by itself. So the reduction bucket stops here. Right? So I, but what would it mean if they could communicate in this way? Well, first of all, the timing of these experiments is not so clear. Right? So it's not only that Alice makes this choice and then at superluminal speed, Bob would be able to read something, but also he could do it in the past because he could make his measurement first. I mean, he could make this measurement before it's even clear that Alice is taking part in the game. But he would have a prediction about what Alice did, even though she doesn't even plan to do it. Right? So, so there's all kinds of uh, temporal paradoxes that arise. So it's, it's his, uh, you could say it's just a plain causality violation. You might not believe in causality, and then I can't help you, but... Um, that's, let, let's just assume this kind of causality holds. And then this machine taking, uh, making, co getting communication on the basis of any kind of correlation, being quantum or classical, um, is impossible because it violates causality. So now, if we assume that as impossible, how do we actually show that joint measurements are not always possible? Because that's sort of the end of this whole reduction chain. So let's do that. So, um, but we can say um, joint measurement of uh, suitable observables. I'll tell you which you have to discuss, right? Observables. Um, would make it possible. So I have to argue for that. I have to show you that in detail and how, how to set it up, of course. Right? But just for the logical structure of it, um, if I can show this, that if I have a joint measurement device for observables in a certain experiment, 
then I can use that to signal, to get signals from Alice to Bob, then, then either I believe in causality, and I'm, I'm sh then sure that joint measurements are not generally possible, and then the whole hierarchy of machines is not, that I show to you, is not generally possible. Or, well, I have to sort of uh, discard causality, which is a pretty tough thing to do. Okay, so just as in the previous cases, uh, the impossibility, impossibility claim that I'm making here is also just a theorem of quantum mechanics. So with the whole formalism ready, I could give you a proof that signaling is not possible in, in quantum mechanics. Actually, it's called the no signaling principle, and it's really built deeply into the way quantum mechanics describes composite systems, that is, the one that the, the two systems that are emitted by the source. So this is the tensor product formalism, and in that context, it's very easy to show that whatever Alice does, Bob won't see a change in his probabilities. So it, it, it is actually a theorem of quantum mechanics anyway. But um, we don't actually have to use quantum mechanics, and that is, that is the argument I want to get to now. Right? Okay, so this is, uh, to, in order to do this argument now, I'll look at correlations in a certain way. And uh, the way I will look at the correlations is in terms of uh, conditional preparations. And it goes like this. So one of the elements in our setup was a source, and that emits these pairs of particles. And uh, so Alice can choose a measurement, A1 or A2, and she gets an output, that's a classical output, and this is plus or minus, or sometimes I'll plus minus one if you wish, sometimes I'd say just plus and minus. Right? And now I want to look at this from the perspective of Bob, because we, in the end we want to see what Bob can see. Right? So, so the way we look at this is um, to take this whole box, with a particular proviso, namely, we only consider only those particles, or consider only those particles, where Alice chose, let's say, uh, A1, and the result was plus, right? And this would be something preparation, some preparation that I would maybe Right, A1 plus. Okay, so this is this is called a conditional preparation. It's the same device, and no, nothing has changed in the experimental setup. It's only a way we want to look at it, right? So we, we sort all the experiments that we make in our statistics. We sort them by this criteria, and only take the ones where this, this criteria is satisfied. Now, from Bob's point of view, he just gets a part. So Bob, has in this in this situation also has two measurements. So Bob, this is Alice's side. So Bob um, has uh, a measurement. Let's call it B one now. That also can be plus minus and uh, a B two. Uh, also does plus minus. And so we want to say what Bob sees given a certain preparation. So what he will do is he will make a coordinate system and he will plot a point for every preparation. He will plot a point in this diagram saying the expectation value of this sign. Now this is, uh, this is a square. Or the maximum he can get is a square. So this, these are 1 and minus 1. So if he always gets for some preparation, always if B1 always gives plus, then we are on this line. If it always gives minus, we are in this line, right? And this correspondingly for B2. But of course, in general, it's a probabilistic outcome. Sometimes it will give plus, sometimes it will give minus, and this is the average value that we plot here. And so this will give one point. Right? So this point we could label with A1 plus. For this particular conditional preparation, we get a point in this diagram. Right? So this is just a way of bookkeeping and keeping track of all these probabilities. 
And this is a completely equivalent way of talking about correlations, yeah, just to separate them according to what Alice did and to what Bob sees. That, that's all. Right? There's nothing, nothing deep about this. Now, if Alice chooses A1, of course, there's also another state um, where she does that, but she gets a minus. Okay? So that would give some other value. And there's also a third state that is important, which is um, what happens when she does A1, but she doesn't select. Now, this not selecting just means there's a certain probability for her to get that result. And with that weight, I have to just combine the two points. So that is, I will be on a line. And this is uh, just, I would just label that with A1. So this is what Bob, this is the point here, encodes exactly the probabilities that Bob can get when Alice measures A1. Okay, so of course, if she can do something else, right, she can uh, do A2. And let's say this is the point A2 minus or so, doesn't really matter now. And there would be another one, I'll put it here, that would be A2 plus. Another conditional preparation. And there is also um, uh, a point that we could call A2. This is the one that you get when um, Alice does A2, but she doesn't, the statistic is not separated according to her result, only according to what she measured. Now, here we get signaling. So in this picture, um, the signaling happens, and it happens exactly at this point, because they're different. So I just gave that as an example now. So this is what we would actually exclude on the basis of causality, because if, if Alice just does her measurements, Bob should not be able to detect what she did, not even probabilistically. Right? So. Um, so these two points actually have to be the same. They have to be, they have to intersect in exactly the same point. Okay? So this is just, so, so far we only have a experimental situations where each of them has two measurements, and each of them, these measurements has two possible outcomes, and then we just do our statistics. Actually, this is exactly the setup for the so-called Bell inequalities. And what we'll, what we'll be talking about is sort of a proof of Bell inequalities uh, from another perspective, from the signaling perspective. But, so the, but the crucial point is that these neutral points, the ones where we don't select, they will be on the line between the two selected points. Right? That's, that's the thing to remember. And they have to be the same. Now, let, let me just give you the experimental data. So these experiments have been done in, in many ways. So experiment. And there are many. It began to be really good statistics and very bright entangled sources with which you can do that. Um, and the, the, the technology there was optical pumping that allowed us to get, uh, allowed Aspe and, and company to, to get really nice implementations of the situation. So here's what they found. So we have the coordinate system, and um, so we have this square. So the, the, nothing can get outside of this square because this is these are plus minus one variables, and the, their expectation cannot be larger than that. Right? So this is trivially the square. And now I, I'll draw one line in here. Uh, let me try to do that properly. This is supposed to be a circle. Okay. It, it turns out that in the experiment that he did, he was using entangled photons and the polarization degree of freedom of photons. And this is uh, quantum mechanically allowed. So the, you could say the quantum state space, the possible preparations that quantum, quantum theory allows would actually lie in this circle. So for the particular measurements that Aspe chose, these are two very specific um, polarization measurements, for them you ne never get full correlations. 
So, so you don't get this corner. Right? So you cannot make a state that has this, this that achieves this point. Right? No quantum state does that. So the all quantum theory tells you you have to be inside the circle. The experimental setup as such does not easily allow you to really make sure that this is all you could get, but this is what quantum mechanics says. Now, the, the points that, uh, that, that they were getting were exactly these. So, I, I won't label them, the, the labels will be the same as there, right? So, they're just at 45 degrees and they go straight through the middle, so these new three points would be just the origin, unpolarized light in that case. So, in either case, no matter what Al uh, uh, is doing, he will see unpolarized light. Right? This, is, this is actually an experimental result. Right? So, and also, it shows that quantum mechanics in this situation satisfies the no signaling principle. So quantum mechanics does not allow this correlation telephone. Right? As I said, it's impossible in quantum mechanics, but um, this is also confirmed here. Okay, so, so far, the story of quantum correlations and uh, the, the bell Aspey experiments. So what happens now when, when we buy at the company Impossible Machines Incorporated, we buy a joint measurement. Now, the only thing that's interesting here is that a joint measurement for Bob's results, right? So that would be the next thing. So let's assume that Bob has a joint measurement. So let's just assume he has that, and then from there, we will have to argue that if he has that uh, machine, then he could actually make the difference. So these lines could no longer intersect at the same point. Okay. Okay. So that's the next step.